coming up on DTNS, Samsung says the Galaxy Fold lives. Gaming adults say they're getting harassed. And did the retweet set us all back? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, July 25th, 2019. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. From the shores of Lake Merritt, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Man, we just had a, an interesting conversation of when <laughs> is it too late for you to respond to a text message? Like, what's your cutoff time? Uh, if you're a good day internet listener, you just heard that. If you're not and you're like, man, I want to hang out with you guys and talk about stuff like that, uh, sign up, become a member on the good day internet tier at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start this show with a few tech things you should know. eBay is launching to manage delivery and end-to-end -end fulfillment offering for eBay sellers in the U.S. next year. The company will store seller merchandise in third-party warehouses and give sellers the option to provide free two- to three-day shipping. Around 1.5 million packages are currently sent daily in the U.S. by eBay sellers, so managed delivery will better brand those packages for the company. NBC and Twitter are partner partnering to bring limited live Olympic coverage and highlights to the social network during the Tokyo 2020 Games. NBC previously worked with Snapchat for the 2018 Winter Games. The Twitter partnership has an interactive twist. Users can vote on preferred events or athletes and live streams lasting around five minutes will be broadcast on the platform. Javelin. Jeb. Team Hamble. Team Hamble. Uh, stock trading service Robinhood is informing some customers it stored their passwords in clear text in an internal system. According to emails seen by ZDNet, Robinhood says it's fixed the issue and is now resetting passwords out of caution and says it did not find any evidence of abuse. Passwords are being recached using the bcrypt algorithm at Robinhood now. Samsung announced it made improvements to the Galaxy Fold and plans to sell it in September for $1,980. The top protective layer of the display has been extended beyond the bezel, which should help deter users from thinking that they should remove it, like the typical screen protector, which was a problem in the past. Both hinges of the device now feature protective caps. The space between the hinge and the body has been reduced, and the screen has been reinforced in additional metal layers underneath. And Apple is buying the majority of Intel's smartphone modem business for $1 billion, as was previously expected. That deal got done a little faster than people expected, actually. Apple will get 2,200 Intel workers, along with equipment, intellectual property, and leases. Let's talk a little bit more about a lawsuit, Justin. Indeed, Tom. U.S. presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard is suing Google for $50 million after her campaign was suspended from buying ads in, uh, for six hours following a debate in Miami in June. Google told the New York Times uh, that its automated system flags unusual activity like sudden increases in spending. The system triggered the suspension of Gabbard's campaign and the account was reinstated shortly afterward. The campaign also believes that its emails are being placed in Gmail spam folders at a disproportionately high rate. Well, maybe you can be a consultant to the campaign on how to defeat the Al Doritos that puts your newsletters indeed, in, indeed. in the spam folder. Uh, but this this lawsuit against Google is very interesting to me because this is this is basically the same thing that underlies a lot of the debates around moderation and whether things should be allowed to be posted, which is, hey, we have an automated system for that. Yeah. And the automated system uh, screwed up. So it took us six hours to notice and get it fixed. The problem is, is that this was a very, very, very valuable six hours for Tulsi Gabbard. Here's the reason why uh, I think this lawsuit is being filed and they should be very, very angry about it. The primary system this year is very unusual just in terms of how much we're paying attention to it. It normally doesn't have this kind of attention this early in the process. But more specifically, the Democratic National Committee has, in an effort to thin out the field a little bit, put in debate floors, debate qualifying floors for people to be able to get on stage during the uh, during these 10 debates, uh, one of which we've already seen, and this is the one she's suing over. So she has a good debate in June, and right afterward, when attention on her is at its highest, she now can't buy ads mm. to uh, get people to fund her campaign. This is why it's even more important, because one of those debate floors is individual donors. And that's a lot of these candidates that are polling around where she is are having a hard time getting to that number. So that six hours 
is prime time where people just saw her on television. They might've connected with her message. Any way that she can connect with them so they can give a dollar is disproportionately valuable to her. And that's why you're seeing such righteous anger in a $50 million lawsuit. As all right. So, 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 so based on all of that and the fact that she might have a really good case, is she going to get $50 million from Google? Likely not. I mean, I'm not a legal expert. I think a lot of these kind of things are, I mean, to be honest, I think that this lawsuit will probably do more to just get her name in the news. So people might uh, reconnect with her. And again, if you are for Tulsi Gabbard, then, uh, you know, donating a dollar to her does do a lot to keep her on the debate stage. Uh, so I think th this does more to just get her name out there and is a little bit of a dog whistle to anti-technology sure. uh, folks. This has become a, 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 certainly a campaign issue to say Tulsi Gabbard versus Google, however simplified that version, that headline would be, that is on brand for her. Yeah, she's not the only candidate on the Democratic side uh, that is using uh, anti-tech uh, as a way to drum up support. Uh, so being one of the only ones that's actually suing a company could could be a badge of honor, I suppose, because that 50 million isn't going to help her get on the debate stage because no. that doesn't qualify as a small donation, right? I mean, it certainly couldn't hurt, but also these court cases don't get resolved fast usually. Uh, so I wouldn't expect her to get that 50 million anytime soon. This is, this is all done for being able to talk about it. It seems. Yeah, no, uh, it, you'll just know if, if the settlement is that uh, the entire head count of Google has to make individual donations. <laughs> to Gabby. I don't think that would be legal. Would it? I mean, I don't know in their name or something like that. Oh, Let the lawyers figure it out. Yeah. Right. Right. That would be, that would be crazy. That'd be really interesting. The Anti-Defamation League published a new report that found 74% of adults who play games online have experienced some form of harassment. In a survey from April of 2019 of more than 1,000 adults, 65% reported severe harassment, including physical threats, stalking, and sustained harassment, while 29% reported reported being doxxed. The report found that Dota 2 had the most adults quit as playing as a result of harassment. Other games found to have high instances of harassment were Counter-Strike, Global Offensive, Overwatch, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, and League of Legends. 80% reported having positive social interactions within games with World of Warcraft and Minecraft and NBA 2K <laughs> having the highest percentage fun games. 35% of respondents said that they engaged in negative social behavior themselves from trolling to using offensive names. The report also found moderation policies outdated with some large commercial spaces unmoderated. ADL suggested that the ESRB take into account online behavior and a publisher's moderation policy when assigning ratings to games. Yeah, this is probably not going to shock anybody, right? These, these numbers are, are not surprising, uh, but they hadn't been collected. And good science means, as I have said in lots of other arenas, going out and, and testing and finding out if your assumptions are true. The fact that it found out that a lot of assumptions are true is not bad or silly. Uh, it's saying, hey, now we've got you know some evidence that that's true. And now we can actually take some steps to address that. If uh, we're seeing that this level of harassment is reported, uh, maybe companies should do something about it. Maybe they should update their moderation policies. Maybe they should do moderation in some cases. And I think it's an interesting suggestion. I'm not sure how I feel about it for the ESRB to take that into account. Uh, I don't know if it should go in the ESRB rating or if there should be some sort of uh, level of of being able to check how 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 bad an online community seems to be that that starts to get weird though like how do you possibly rate that but it's an interesting suggestion to say like hey the game itself may not be that violent but you may be exposing yourself to a lot of uh, people talking trash at you and maybe you don't want that you should know that before you go in the game before I you buy the game I think it's important that it be reported to the ESRB and I do think that the more and more uh, uh interaction with these game platforms results in online multiplayer situations where there are toxic communities then uh, uh, especially because we're talking about a lot of these uh, games are are franchises right they are yeah. they are people they are games that make you know different versions of themselves and if you have a persistent toxic community in one then maybe on the next game you should just uh, the the uh, the publisher should know Hey, look, we're going to ding you a little bit the next version of this game because you didn't take steps to make this better. 
Also, 1,000 adults is not a huge sample size, but to have 65% of those adults saying, yes, I've experienced severe harassment, which include physical threats, that is that is not to be taken lightly. That is that is bad news for any online community, whether I'm, you're a gaming community or otherwise. I'm sure some people are like, yeah, that's that's just the way it is, right? Like, mm. you know, people talk like that to each other in the game. Um, I suppose maybe that I, I, is the I, I way think, it is. I think I think gaming ribbing and I'm going to hurt you in real life are very different things. Uh, well, also, certainly, but but I'm just saying, like I know there are people out there, like yeah, but you know, people say these things. You don't have to take them seriously. Okay, if that's the game you want to play, that's fine. But I think it's fair to say people should know, like oh, people are going to threaten to kill you. Uh, if you do poorly on their team in this online game before you go in there. And also, he <laughs> heaven forbid that your voice uh, sound like a woman or somebody not white. Because oh, yeah, yeah. because by the way, it's important to note, this applies to both text and voice chat. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, if somebody threatens me, uh, you know, like I'm going to come to your house and hurt you, eh, just not fun anymore. Yeah. Don't, don't want to play that game. It's like, no, that's it. No, I'm back to mine. Yep. Would have liked to have known that before I spent money on this game. Mm -hmm. Pew Research Center analyzed every video posted by 43,770 YouTube channels with more than a quarter million subscribers in the first week of 2019. Among the findings, 10% of those channels uh, created 70% of the videos posted. The top 10% of the most viewed videos uh, made up to 79% uh, of all the views in that period. Only 17% of the quarter million videos analyzed were fully in English. Videos intended for children were longer and uh, uh, tended to receive more views than other videos. Videos featuring, featuring a child younger than 13, whether intended for children or not, received nearly three times as many views on average as other types of videos. And videos with children targeted at children were the most popular kind of video of all. And finally, 16% of English language videos were related to current events or politics. The majority were international and did not mention the United States. Yeah, I, uh, th I think this is this is a good perspective on, on YouTube when thinking about what YouTube should do and why they're behaving the way they are is that, yes, a lot of children watching YouTube, a lot of children in YouTube videos and uh, a lot and, of videos intended for children to watch. And 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 so for whatever all of, reason, all yeah. of these conversations about children watching YouTube are like, well, but it's not meant for anyone younger than 13. Well, it's being used that way uh, in a dominant fashion. And YouTube needs to address that. The other part of this I find very fascinating is uh, the the amount of English language videos and the content of current events or politics implying that the large majority of viewers of video out here are not in the US. And so a lot of these things where the where the US has a concern and YouTube seems to be slow to uh, accommodate it, maybe because of that. Uh, I don't think that we should be surprised by this. Uh, America, although it is obviously the home of YouTube and very, very popular here, we talk a lot about the disruption that YouTube has brought to our entertainment landscape. We have a lot of children oriented programming. We have multiple cable networks. We have multiple over-the-top uh, uh, streaming platforms around the world. That's not always the case in in native languages. You know, this is something that YouTube is a global force uh, uh, in a very different way in some other parts of the world than it is here, where it's just, oh wow, it's this cool thing that the, the kids are paying attention uh, attention to. But they're in, in more restrictive media environments or less uh, uh, children centric media environments. It can be. Uh, the only game in town. All right. We've had a couple of stories in a row with numbers, with hard numbers. And let's get back to some theory, some qualitative analysis. Yeah. Jonathan's a train, a uh, big fan of Jonathan's a train. He's a really smart guy has a piece in the New Yorker about what he calls intellectual debt. Uh, no, that's not what you think it is. Uh, that is studying and discovering that something works, but without knowing how. So you know something works, but you can't, you haven't figured out the reason. So there's, he calls that an intellectual debt. There's, there's sort of a deficit in our understanding. Uh, for instance, aspirin existed in many forms as a folk remedy. Uh, and then aspirin itself, the modern day version, uh, was discovered in 1897. But a convincing explanation of how aspirin actually worked to dull pain and reduce inflammation was not determined until 1995. We were just using aspirin like, I don't know, takes care of my headache. Don't know how it works. 
So as a train suggests, the machine learning also incurs intellectual debt because we don't know how algorithms get good at identifying cats, et cetera. We, we know how to train an algorithm. We know how to set up an algorithm, but how it actually learns what is a cat and what isn't, we don't know. That's a black box. And that means we will not know when it fails unless we know already what the answer should be. We can, we can tell how good it is at identifying cats because we know cats. But there's a lot of scenarios for machine learning, especially in public health, where they're saying, we want machine learning to discover something that we haven't seen yet. And that intellectual debt can be a problem if we can't tell if it's right or not. Uh, not a big deal, as the train says, for creating new pizza recipes, right? But kind of a big deal for health recommendations. Uh, he points out a study from MIT's Lab 6 in 2017 that altered the pixels throughout a cat photo so that the photo itself just looked like a regular cat to a human. But Google's image recognition algorithm Inception, which does the classification for image search, identified it as guacamole. <laughs> and that's, that's not a weird looking cat. It was a green cat or, you know, <laughs> it was sitting in a taco bowl or something. No, yeah. it was it was just a regular image of a cat. But pixels that we couldn't see were put in in a pattern that fooled the machine learning because the machine learning doesn't actually know what a cat is. It knows this arrangement of pixels. And I say cat, I, I get told I'm right. So I keep doing that. Now, as the train is concerned, the trade secrets, which keep us from being able to see data sets, proprietary code from businesses, could hinder how the analysis of ML works because we can't work on figuring out how a data set ends up with a particular result. And that reliance on well-performing AI could reduce human oversight and prevent us from catching errors or bias. So something to be thinking of as we use machine learning. I think an obvious question that someone might ask is, well, okay, aren't humans the ones that are putting the machine learning uh, um, trials into place? If Lab 6 altered the pixels of a cat photo in order to trick the machine, couldn't they teach the machine to understand that it was being tricked? Sort of, yes. Like doing things like that help to uh, figure out, okay, how do we how do we make sure that it doesn't get tricked by that? Uh, but the principle might be so broad that, well, we could teach it how to not, how to recognize that is not, is, is a cat, not guacamole. Uh, but is that lesson going to be widely applicable? And the point is, other bad actors could also go in and figure out other ways to rearrange things, other ways to fool the algorithm sure. uh, to get away with stuff. I mean, so it's, it, it's more of a, a gen general situation of like, how do we make sure that we improve machine learning so that it doesn't have these errors as often? Well, yeah. And look, all systems can be hacked, including uh, the ones between our ears, right? Like, like there, there are many, many ways that we can, uh, that we are fooled and, and machine learning is no different. But I do think that this is a, a good, uh, everybody let's pay attention to the reality of what machine learning is, that this is not a AI and machine learning gets tossed around so much these days that we, we kind of tend to think that it's like, oh no, it's at a certain point, it becomes a magic spell and it's not. It, mm -hmm. it, it's a program and it has all the failabilities of, of a program and we shouldn't over rely on it or just assume that it knows best going forward. Because as Sarah pointed out, it is just a system that we're going to have to bit by bit show, uh, you know, we're going to have to patch when people try to fool it in the same way that we patch any system. Yeah. And, and, and it gets to the point where saying and a machine learning can recognize a cat is an easy way to express something. So we understand what it's doing. Like, Oh, when, a, when I give it a picture of a cat, it'll tell me whether it's a cat or not, but that's not actually what it's doing. It's a misrepresentation because the machine learning doesn't know what a cat is. It has no conception of cat. Uh, it doesn't have a way to check like, wait a minute, that cat looks a little weird. It, we don't know how it's determining what a cat is and what it isn't. And, and that's, that's kind of the point of the trains column. Hey folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Chris Weatherall has uh, had a conversation with the folks at BuzzFeed saying he regrets building the retweet button for Twitter. He led the team that made the retweet button in 2009. Initially, when he was working on it, he said he thought it would help elevate underrepresented voices and to a large extent it has. But after he launched the button and saw how people were using it, he says he thought we might have just handed a four-year-old a loaded weapon. Now, he's not alone. Jason Goldman, the head of product for Twitter in 2009, is quoted in this BuzzFeed article as saying, the biggest problem is the quote retweet. Quote retweet allows for the dunk 
It's the dunk mechanism because you can retweet it and then put your little add a little yeah extra, extra something to it. Extra yeah. something yeah. Uh, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey also told BuzzFeed, definitely thinking about the incentives and ramifications of all actions, including retweet. Retweet with comment, for instance, might encourage more consideration before spread. So he's like, well, maybe it's not so much dunking. Maybe it slows you down. And the concern seems to be around how the retweet button reduced friction in spreading. So before you had to copy and paste to make a retweet and you had to type RT. And that slowed you down, made you think about it. And maybe all of that was too much trouble for you. Like, you know what? It's not worth it. And you might not do it. Whereas pressing a button, boom, you didn't even have to think about it. Yeah, I'm going to spread that. Boom, there it goes. That kind of virality attracted publications and journalists and politicians to the platform. It caused Facebook to add a retweet-like function at the time called Mobile Share. And in 2014, Weatherall says he started noticing how Gamergate posters were using retweets. Uh, there was no real defense for targets against reputational harm when they were targeting retweets at a particular person. And he says, it dawned on me that this was not some small subset of people acting aberrantly. This might be how people behave, and that scared me to death. Now, he doesn't say we should get rid of the retweet button. He has some ideas about what we could do about it. But Justin, I know just the hand wringing has an effect on you. <sighs> Tom, uh, this bothers me. It just, it, 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 is, it is a trend that we are now seeing, and be they ex-founders, ex-board members, ex-engineers. This is just this new trend in stories where Dr. F uh, a, a, a beleaguered Dr. Frankenstein uh, comes out and, uh, you know, very dramatically says, yes, it was me. I built the monster that ruined society. And we all uh, think about the flaws in our own humanity and what we have wrought with this technology. It just is tiresome to me and it's not that he doesn't have good points it's not that there's not a good discussion to be had around uh the virality of retweets although i personally find that if we are this just is a very engineer's way of looking at the world that uh the world would have been different if i would have programmed these things <laughs> a little differently because i am the, the 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 true engineer of all humanity uh, and and this would not have happened. Gamergate would not have existed on the level that it was if I had not built the retweet button, which I don't subscribe to, but I can get where they're where they're where they're coming from. There's a lot of stuff that is now the norm within Twitter that was created by the community. Hashtags, another example. Twitter didn't do that. People just started doing that. And so it became something that has become part of uh, the social network vernacular over a period of time. I personally, uh, the retweet of, you know, if Justin says, hey, had a great time on DTNS. Here's the link. I might just go ahead and retweet that. I yeah. don't know. It's easier, easier than, you know, but I might, if you were to say, had a great time on DTNS, but something weird happened, then I might do the quote retweet and add a little context. And I, I actually think that that's a great tool. And it, that's actually what I use more than anything. The, the idea that well, bad actors are, you know, using this button to 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 spread misinformation is not actually changing the behavior that existed before. It's making it slightly easier. But I I I'm I'm not yeah, I'm not sure that the retweet button has actually uh, you know, brought down our society all that much. Well, yeah, it's overstating it. And I get what Justin's saying where uh, a lot of these a lot of these protestations tend to feel like I, I I don't want you to hate me for being the engineer that worked on the thing you now hate, yeah. right? On the other hand, I but, do but think- also, But also inherently give me credit for building a thing you love that you- Right, it was me. Worse than you. I do think <laughs> though that it is legitimate and, and a good thing for an engineer to say, man, I wish I would have thought more about this. And now yeah. knowing what I know, let me come up with solution. And that's where I'll give Weatherall some points where some other- of these sorts of things I've read or just end up in. And so it needs to be shut down essentially is kind of the implication where Weatherall says, no, we can't take it away, but there is a problem in that frictionlessness. In your example of retweeting daily tech news show with the retweet button, I do that all the time before the retweet button. I wouldn't have copy and pasted your post and put it in mine with an RT. I would have been like, well, if I'm going to do that, I might as well just write my own. Right. It mm. definitely has that effect of making you, hit that button in, in a way you wouldn't have before. So whether else solutions that he proposes are if a group 
not not an individual, but an audience, he calls it, is regularly amplifying what he calls awful posts. Mm -hmm. Devil's in the details how you determine what an awful post is, certainly. Mm -hmm. But if we all agreed on what an awful post was and a group was retweeting that and you could see like, okay, these thousand people are all doing this, you suspend the ability of members of that audience to retweet to slow it down to to say like okay you're you're breaking the rules by doing this and so we're going to we're going to pull that but we're not pulling it from everybody he also well, yeah. says maybe a better way where you don't have to determine content would just be to limit the number of times any tweet can be retweeted which is similar to what whatsapp is doing with forwards you can only forward a message 5 times well but but the, the thing the thing with whatsapp is those are private groups that you are then creating you know a, a mass hysteria by well, they're way. often public groups but but sure. yeah yeah, but but they are they are self-defined kind of groups. Mm -hmm. In a world where you're only able to retweet something a certain amount of time, then the new measure of what is a really successful retweet will be how many versions of the same tweet you made so you can retweet it. Uh, over but that would slow time. it down because you'd have to make multiple what, versions. Yes, and and yeah, it would. Uh, my point is, this was a community behavior before they had the button. And so if we're saying that things got worse when you eliminated whatever that moment of time was between copying and writing RT before uh, that tweet, then theoretically it would be better if we could, we had to wait even longer. Maybe we have to wait an hour. Maybe we have to wait 12 hours. Maybe it could be a three day <laughs> waiting period, like buying a gun before you, you read. Okay. Uh, now don't we bring think about guns. it. I know. Well, I'm it's sort saying. of like, okay. God so it, it's like our conversation. It, it's the kind of thing, like if somebody that you consider sort of like, Ooh, social media villain, you might follow them on Twitter. Does that mean you like them? Not necessarily. We've all seen the bios that say retweets are not endorsements. Does that mean that every time you retweet uh, something that someone said, it means that you're endorsing what they said? Well, no, but there's been a backlash from people saying, okay, well, you can't do that. You have to provide context or else people will think that you are endorsing it. And so I think that there's some ambiguity there that, that, it, that, that does need to be addressed. I, I, I think you may be discounting uh, how much of an effect that delay has. It's, I, I don't think it has to be days or hours, but the idea that I had to cut and paste kept me from retweeting things that just clicking a button kind of abdicates my responsibility. And I think on a massive scale of hundreds of millions of users, that doesn't make a difference. So even if you just say you can't retweet unless you've clicked the link, or you say you can retweet this, but maybe it'll be delayed for three minutes and you have to confirm. I don't know. I, I don't know what the best answer is, but I think there's something to what he's saying. I don't know. Two-factor authentication in a seven-day wait <laughs> period. That's what I'm running my campaign on. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, just be careful that you don't uh, get your account suspended by Google and everything will be fine. Uh, you know what won't be suspended? Our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on others, whether they be retweet stories or other ones. Anything that you want us to put our eyes on. Dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's check out the mailbag. Sumi Dip pointed out that while Netflix mobile only plan, which we talked about in India at 199 rupees per month, is cheaper than Hotstar's premium 299 rupees per month, you can pay for a year of Hotstar premium for 999 rupees, which actually makes that cheaper. And Netflix's full premium plan is 799 rupees per month. Sumi Dip adds, I've added myself, uh, I have myself unsubscribed to Netflix because of its cost. And even this uh, 199 plan of rupees, not tempting enough. India is a price sensitive market. And for Netflix to be able to uh, have deep inroads, they'd have to price it more competitively. In my opinion, 199 plan isn't going to make much of a difference. Also, Netflix has the disadvantage of fewer local content offerings as compared to Hotstar or even Amazon Prime Video. More new Bollywood movies make their way to Amazon Prime Video than to Netflix, and they don't have the television content that Hotstar does. So the op uh, operative principle in the mind of the Indian consumer is summarized in the popular Hindi phrase, Sundar Sasta Tikau, which means attractive, cheap, and durable. Yeah, I, I think... There, I think it's legitimate to compare the 199 plan to the 299 Hotstar plan because people don't look at things that closely sometimes and will think, oh, well, I, I know Hotstar is 299. 199 is cheaper. I'm, I'm, that's, that's attractive to me, right? That's cheap. I don't know if it's durable or not. But, uh, but your point is well taken that 
when you look at it closer, Hotstar's plan is actually more comparable to Netflix's plan because it's not limited to mobile only. Uh, and Netflix's plan is a lot uh, more expensive. So whether Netflix wins that marketing war or not is interesting. I think the content offering is the bigger hurdle that Netflix has to overcome. They And they have done it before where they come into a market and just don't have the content to compete with the incumbent, but end up getting that content eventually. It takes them a while, but they get it. So that will be the thing to keep your eye on to see if Netflix is really going to survive or not. That said, I don't think it's a bad idea for them to have the 199 mobile plan, but I, I think it's well well taken by Sumidip to point out like that's this isn't the silver bullet. They don't win just because of that. Thanks, everybody who contributes to our mailbag every day. We love you. We also love Justin Robert Young, who contributes to our show at least once a week, sometimes if we're lucky, even more. Justin, where can people find out what other stuff you're doing? Oh, well, you can find uh, me talking about politics at politicspoliticspolitics.com. It's also a little bit a little bit of a blog now these days. So if you want, uh, I'm doing old fashioned writing with these fingers. I'm dusting them off and actually <laughs> writing things on a fairly regular basis. Uh, so that's pretty fun. But go ahead and check out the uh, the, the podcast. Uh, had a really uh, fun interview actually this week with a, uh, a, a a night chair at the Annenberg School at the University of Southern California, all about. Uh, religion and politics and how uh, that has evolved over the years and specifically how all the 2020 candidates are uh, using their own religious backgrounds to shape some of their message. Fascinating, no matter where on the spectrum you find it. Uh, uh, so go ahead and check that out. Politics, politics, politics.com. Hey, a big thank you to John F. Walzer and Alan Moore, who both just started supporting Daily Tech News Show. Welcome into the tent. Uh, you're in the membership alongside years long members like Alan Shepard, uh, and others. So I hope you enjoy, uh, the ad free RSS feed, the special episodes. I've got one coming up, uh, this weekend, sort of talking about why I'm always for, but also against the thing you love. If that sounds interesting, uh, that's my editor's <laughs> desk topic, uh, coming this Saturday. If you're a member at the $5 level and up at patreon.com slash DTNS. We've got an email address and that email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We are also live. If you can join us live, we'd love to have you Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Aaron Carson from CNET. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>